Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who has a fine selection of slightly used camping and forestry equipment he'd love to sell you. It's Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! (laughs) What's up, Brent Adams? Yeah, there's a guy named Henry that's looking for that stuff, buddy. I love that reference, my friend. I absolutely love it. Thank you. That That's swinging for the fences, if there ever was. Uh, how are you, man? How was your uh, New Year's? Happy New Year. Happy 2016. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, to answer your question, my holiday season was fantastic. It was, uh, it was a wonderful Yule celebration, J-U-L, and... Uh, Not Y O U apostrophe L L. No. Um, although I will accept the I will accept the, the the spelling in in the context of Scrooge. You'll love it. Um, <laughs> now I have to kill all of you, mother. Help me. Anyway, um, <laughs> Brent's going to gr- take a moment by himself. I I am. I had a great holiday. My parents came up. Sister. Spent uh, spent the holiday with us, hanging out with Z. Warm <laughs> temperatures here, as as you may have heard. It was very mild weather, so much so that two days after Christmas, we took Z to the park in this little uh, this little cheerleader, this little Florida Gators cheerleader outfit that my mom got for because uh, we're Gator fans around here. And uh, we just uh, let Z go run wild on the playground. Took a bunch of pictures and uh, put together a. 2016 calendar full of Z wearing her Gators cheerleading outfit to give to uh, my best friend, who's a big fan of the Tennessee Volunteers, the Gators' chief rival. <laughs> That's awesome. So I created this great situation where, on the one hand, he has to have a picture of his niece uh, on his on his wall every month of the year, but on the other hand, he has to be reminded of his team's failure to defeat my team. Ha! <laughs> that remind me not to get on the ba- on your bad side. <laughs> it was just great, just grinding it in. Thank God Tennessee doesn't have a professional hockey team. Yeah, no kidding. What the oh, fuck? No. Would, what the fuck would we know about hockey? <laughs> they do. I just happen to hate them. You, listen, you, uh, you you give a bunch of us sticks and turn us loose on an ice field, and a, ho- a game of hockey is not what's going to happen. The, well, as as is evidenced by watching the Nashville Predators. Um, <laughs> uh, well, good, man. I'm glad to hear you had a nice holiday. We took the week off. Uh, I also had a nice holiday down in Long Island, uh, enjoying my time down there. Brought the old PS4 with me to do a little game playing. Sweet! Uh, while I was down there, I did pick up uh, I did pick up a couple things over the holiday me too. Uh, season. Yeah. Um, n- not big ones. I picked up The Witcher 3 on the PS4. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it was on sale for 25 bucks. I think I told you, and I, I did post on the activity feed, I... I like buying I, uh, games twice. Yeah, I saw that. Yes, I like buying games twice. I um, my PC is no longer in the same room as my uh, television, and uh, I uh, really you looked missed- into the Steam Link, and it seems like it's not doing a great job over Wi-Fi. So I opted with instead of buying the Link, uh, I just bought The Witcher Three for twenty five bucks. I undoubtedly it's worth it. Although I'll tell that does you, solve the problem nicely. Uh, well, we'll talk about it a little bit in the what we're playing section, and then I purchased. Um, I went and repurchased. I don't. I can't remember if I told you this or not. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying you bought another game again? Uh, sort of again, but not exactly. We might have to have uh, a talk. I don't know if you remember the shenanigans that ensued. I know, around... I'm aware of the shenanigans going on in this show right now. Well, I, I don't know if you remember that I uh, played about 120 hours of Battlefield 4. Yeah, I do, I do recall reading something about that now. And then returned it. For a full refund, all hundred and ten dollars I had paid for it. So. I understand that there's a that the, the, they have your picture hanging up over at EA customer service with a with like a crosshairs. They might. On they your very well might. And they're but just the like game, be on the lookout for this man. Battlefield Four uh, and all of its DLC was on sale for twenty bucks, and apparently <laughs> Dice LA, uh, who took it over, uh, has uh, really <laughs> been fixing the game over the last year. So I rebought <laughs> Battlefield Four. Including all of the DLC for twenty dollars. You know, I also would like to point out here that didn't you go back and buy the Last of Us Remastered Edition also? No, 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 no. I did not go back and buy that. It came uh, free when I I would not have bought that. Oh yes, you would have. No, Come on. I would you not have bought that. You just sat here and talked about how you rebought all these games. You know, and like one that you didn't even like all that much. There's no way you can honestly tell me and the Outlaw Gamer Radio audience that you would not have rebought. 
the remastered edition of The Last of Us just because you have a problem, Lauren. You have a problem. No, 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 no. That game came with my uh, with my uh, purchase of the PS4. I think when I bought yeah yeah when did, I bought my did. second PS4. Uh, you just, after selling the, the first one in Brazil, and I, I, I came with my second PS4, I would not much, have paid for that. You got game. too much money to spend is your problem. You need to start a trendy <laughs> cocaine habit or something. But just to be clear, uh, the PS4 was not... I don't have two PS4s. I sold one in Anymore. Brazil and bought one in America. But was there an overlap? Was there a period of time where you had bought your one in America but had not yet sold the one in Brazil? Just be honest with me on this. Um, 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 well, <laughs> th- there was, the but, answer is yes. You own yes. two PS fours for some amount of time for, for three months. I lived in America with one PS four while my life wife lived in Brazil with the other. PS4. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But All again, right. to be fair, when I sold the one in Brazil, I've sold it for full price enough to pay for the new one in America. Yeah, but you were just taking advantage of Brazil's. Economy, I guess. I don't know. Well, I don't know let's what, not make this I don't racial, Brent. Word to use for that situation. No, that's that's a true story. So anyway, I, uh, so what did you pick up? Did you buy some stuff over the holiday? Yes and no. I was gifted uh, by a very good friend of mine. I was gifted a copy of Disney Infinity. Okay, uh, and it was actually cool the way he did it. I'm going to share this anecdote because this is something to think about for other people. And also, if there's anybody listening over at the retail side of things for companies such as Best Buy or Target, as an example, you might want to listen to this too. So I get a text message from my good buddy Grant, who lives uh, out in Oregon now, on the other side of the country, and he sends me a text message on like December 21st, the 22nd. Says, "Hey, do me a favor. Go to uh, go to the Target store." there where you live and uh, go to the customer service counter and ask to pick up order number thus and such. It's under my name and you're the alternate name to pick it up. And what he had done is he had placed an order online to be picked up locally at the, at the store right down the street from me. So I go down there, I tell him my name, I give him my ID and they hand me a bag and say, Merry Christmas. And so I go home and I look inside this target bag and I've got a starter pack for Disney infinity. And then I also got Han and Chewie, the, uh, the, you know, the, the figures, the add on figures. And so I got uh, like this whole like little Disney infinity thing going on. But anyway, the the reason I I told that story is that's a really cool idea. I'm going to do that in the future rather than, Rather than uh, than buy stuff and ship it to people, and, and you know, occasionally I'll just order from Amazon and ship it straight to them. But I'm going to start buying things at their local stores that they can just go pick up. That's a great idea. It is a great idea, and what would be an even better idea is if Target and Best Buy invested in a bunch of gift bags that they could just uh, put the items inside of, cinch up, and hand you a gift bag that you can just take home and put under your tree. That is a great idea. That is is what would be a really good idea. So anyway. And hence how you're going to become a millionaire. Yeah, other than the fact that I just gave the idea away for free. But anyhow. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, so I got Disney Infinity. And that's awesome. And I assume I'm, we'll be talking about that when we, we hit will. the road. We will. I was playing a little bit of that. But I also, as a result of getting up, uh, picking up Disney Infinity, I also picked up Lego Dimensions. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. Excellent. All right. Well. Uh, welcome back. We took a week off. Welcome back to everybody who uh, had uh, had a new year. I I, uh, in, I hope you all enjoyed I'm, your I'm new year. I'm pretty sure we all had a new year. Happy. Well, not necessarily. The Jewish New Year's in September. Let's not generalize. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm just saying uh, that from you know where we were last year, the Earth has in fact traveled around the sun one time. So, <laughs> um, happy New Year to all. Happy holidays. When's Chinese New Year? I can't remember. Um. I don't know the it's, answer it's to late, that question. It's like late January, early February, something like that? I, uh, think, I, don't, I don't know. know. I actually don't know. I was trying to think of a joke, but I couldn't think of one that I could make in which I wouldn't sound like a racist asshole. When is Chinese New Year? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Siri. Of course you are. As a matter of fact, isn't Siri going to start doing the show soon? I hope so, God, because she has some, uh, such dulcet tones. February 8th. Uh, exactly right. So we're not in the Chinese New Year just yet. <laughs> um, no. No, as it turns out. So uh, welcome back to everybody. Uh, it was a, it was horrible being off from you guys for a whole week, uh, but there's a lot to talk about, Brent. There's been a God, lot of yes. news, uh, and I am super excited about the first item in the garage. I know uh, you this are. Is, this is actually one of my if not, one of my most anticipated, if not my most anticipated game, at least at least at this point of 2016. Right. Uh, Unravel announced uh, the side-scrolling platformer announced a release date uh, on the PS4, Brent, and it is uh, February 9th. January 2nd, as far as the Chinese are concerned. <laughs> That's but, exactly right. Uh, yeah. 
And this is a very cool story trailer for Unravel, which you see, as far as the gameplay goes, it's stuff that we've seen before, but it's sort of framed in the context of, of what this game is, is about in the larger scope, which is, I, I think, uh, uh, something pretty personal to, uh, to, the, to the developer, but you know, some sort of fundamental things about, about human truth and, and memories and, uh, and, and passing those things on one generation to the next and, and that sort of thing comes through in this trailer. Indeed, it looks beautiful as always, Brent. It's it does. I, I couldn't be happier that the announcement of the release date is is so close. Um, yeah, it's just about just over a month. That's the way it should be. Like that's the, like everybody just take a look at this. Like this is what I want. I want to. I want. I want to see the game. I want. I want. Oh, this is really kind of interesting. I want to hear a little bit about it. I want to hear why it's being done, how it's being done, and then one day I want you to give me a trailer and be like, oh yeah, by the way, you can buy it in four weeks. That's right. what I want right there. This is a game I'm super excited about, and to find out when they announce the release date that it's four or five weeks away, as opposed to coming in November. Yeah, uh, is which is meaningful which, to me. which means actually coming in April. But that's exactly as right. we all so know. Very very excited. Brent unravel coming February 9th. 2060 on the PS4. Right. Coming uh, next in up, November. Brent, uh, <laughs> next, no. <laughs> next up is uh, from an announcement from December 15th. Now, we obviously, before we took a week off, yeah, this is the right show after prior we... to that was our Game of the Year show. And yes. so we weren't really necessarily doing news items. Um, but there was a news item right around the time of that show that is a pretty big deal, Brent. Indeed. Uh, Hideo Kojima, formerly of, of Konami, officially formally now. Of Konami. As of December 15th. His last day uh, under contract was December 15th. And on December 15th, strangely enough, Kojima announced a new partnership with Sony. And there were, I believe there were rumors about this in the days leading up to it. I seem to remember reading something about it prior to it being announced. But uh, there's a video with Andrew House and Hideo Kojima himself just uh, announcing this, this new partnership and that they're very excited to be working together and blah, blah, blah. Of course, none of us are all that surprised. I, I, from, a, from a gamer standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. If you have a long history with uh, Metal Gear Solid, it's always been a franchise I've associated with the PlayStation 2, even though it has been cross, uh, it's been cross-platform for a while now. Um, but I've always associated uh, Kojima with the PlayStation 2, so at least in my mind, uh, this is not really a surprising thing. I'm sure that there's some business stuff behind the scenes that make a lot of sense for all parties involved, but it seems like Kojima does have a new home at Sony and is going to be developing uh, some new video game with them that's going to blow our minds and be very innovative and all that, I'm sure. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I realize that might sound sarcastic, but I, I totally believe that that'll be the case. There is also a little bit of an update on this story. Apparently, there was, and I, I can't remember, Lauren, if you have the story up, you can, you can give me the specifics, but there was at least some information somewhere that it would not be a PlayStation exclusive, that it would show up on PC, whatever this game eventually turns into, that it would be on PlayStation 4, followed by a debut on PC, but that information has since been scrubbed, yeah? Uh, yeah, it just says, uh, update, a since-deleted Q&A article on Medium, published by PlayStation Community Manager, explained that Kojima's game would come to PC after PlayStation 4. We've contacted Kojima Productions for additional information. Okay. It doesn't say anything more than that. So, But the bottom line is that if, if you had it in your mind that Kojima was going to be only doing games for the PlayStation 4 uh, forever and ever now, maybe not the case. It, it looks like uh, there may be... Maybe some stuff that he's doing that will go to the PC. Of course, you know, Sony puts games on the PC. As far as it going to the Xbox One, uh, that's maybe a little bit more sketchy a situation, but we'll see. Yep. As you said, Brent, this obviously comes as no surprise that Kojima's partnering with PlayStation, but I think, uh, and I, I don't think that it obviously comes as a surprise to gamers that Kojima would be making more games, but I think it probably is very reassuring, particularly uh, for people who are big fans of the Metagross Solid franchise and big fans of Hideo Kojima, um, I'm sure it's probably good to hear that officially he has severed ties with Konami and officially he will be starting his own uh, game development company and that something is underway. Uh, I'm sure that feels very good to a lot of people. Feels good to me. I, I'm I'm curious to see what he does next. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what that will be. I don't know if he'll, you know, he'll continue doing anything that explores, you know, the stealth action genre. Obviously uh, the Metal Gear franchise is staying at Konami. So he's not going to be doing that, but uh, you know maybe there's something else that uh, that he could do. Maybe he could partner up with John Carpenter, and they could do a stealth action series based around the actual Snake 
Snake Plissken. And and they could make that game. And yes, <laughs> I'm sexually aroused before I you think, ask yourself. I think that's a very interesting uh, suggestion, though I do have a little bit of trouble seeing Snake Plissken being uh, stealthy. Are we talking about? He was all stealth. Like, like that. He, he went in on a glider so they couldn't hear him coming. He was in stealth mode the whole time until the fucking cannibal showed up. <laughs> uh, all right. So obviously I don't know my Snake Plissken lore well enough. He had a MAC-10 with a silencer on it. The silencer is longer than the MAC-10. Why would you have a suppressor <laughs> that long if you weren't trying to be stealthful, Lauren? <laughs> this is insanity. Uh, oh, I wish you guys could see Brett right now. I think a little tear just dribbled down his face. I'm going to throw something. Uh, all right, Brett. So next up, we have a, an interesting next step for another company, Crytek. Yeah, man, uh, this was cool. I I like this one. Yeah, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this, Brent. This is a uh, they announced a new game called The Climb. Yeah, uh, which is uh, designed for uh, I want to say the Oculus Rift, and they're partnering with Oculus. Although I, you know, at this point, there's no indication that it's an Oculus exclusive necessarily, or that these things will never come yeah. to other VR platforms. Because um, obviously, Crytek wants to to support as many as possible. Right. And so, and right now we're kind of in that space with VR where like nobody's really saying exclusive much. Some people are, but yeah. uh, a lot of people don't want to say it, but either way, this is a VR game that's being designed uh, in partnership with Oculus Rift, particularly around the uh, Oculus touch controllers, which um, although we don't have this in the dock today, um, the Oculus touch controllers since our last show have been delayed uh, into uh, the latter half. They were supposed to be the first half of 2016. And now, Seems it will be in the latter half of 2016. Um, but this cl- the climb is is literally a game about rock climbing. It's literally rock climbing, and which is it is. But but that's what makes it so awesome. Okay, well, there's two things. There's two things about this that make it really awesome. Number one, it's about rock climbing, and number two, it's about having disembodied hands. And I can't tell you the number of times I've fantasized about having disembodied hands so I could choke myself out while I'm watching. Well, anyway, never mind. But the point is <laughs> that. That I have always been interested in rock climbing, is what I meant to say. Uh, and, and this is true. Actually, I really do have a, a keen interest in rock climbing. The problem is uh, is that uh, gravity affects me more than, <laughs> than it does other people. And so, uh, and, and it also affects uh, my, abil- my upper body strength ability to uh, overcome the force of gravity on my uh, slightly larger than average uh, frame. frame. And yes. so... I really, really do uh, actually have a keen interest in rock climbing. It's something that that I would like to do, and VR rock climbing sounds awesome. Uh, it, it sounds like maybe something that that would get me excited enough to to go and do the real thing. Uh, more more than I have been able to do thus far. Yeah, it's a it, it's it looks fascinating, and I highly encourage you guys to take a look at it. These kinds of experiences, Brent, I think are going to be. I'm really excited for these types of VR experiences. Some me too. things that um, that. I, I wouldn't think of as being necessarily a, video a, a, a full-on video game. Yeah. And, the, you know, there's some interesting videos about the climb that are out there now, some dev diaries where they talk about how they were sort of in the process of uh, looking to make a game for VR. And in the process, they, they implemented this climbing mechanic. They took it into a room. And I can't remember if it was Brendan Arebi or, or uh, uh, maybe it was Nate Mitchell. They were talking to one of the guys from, from Oculus. And the guys, you know, put this demo on and said you know what, man, the, the, the climbing part of this is fantastic. What if you just developed that piece of it? Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that's, I, I just think it's fascinating. I think we're going to get these super, super interesting cool. experiences. It looks, the, it looks beautiful. Um, and, and I'm just so excited to see what just fundamentally different experiences can be had in VR uh, because of VR. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I'm curious to know, I don't know if you'll appreciate this reference, Brent, but I like, uh, you know, buying things w- twice. Yeah, we know, we know. But I like stuff. <laughs> I like stuff that occurs. Uh, adventure movies that occur in nature. Uh, even the more cheesy ones. Movies like Cliffhanger, for example. Um, <laughs> I love Cliffhanger. What are you talking better, about? Perhaps a better example might be the Iger Sanction. The Iger um, Sanction is great. Yeah, it's a fa- but movies a like that movie. that take place in the outdoors like that. And to be honest with you, I the closest thing I've ever seen a representation of in video games is something probably more along the lines of either a Tomb Raider right. um, yeah. or maybe something in a game like Siberia, which is a point and click. Well, what about something like DayZ? I mean, a lot, a lot of DayZ was, you know, you against the elements. It wasn't always just you against the zombies, you know? It is. You're right. You're right. It is. But it's, but it's you against the elements 
trying to stay alive, fundamentally different from uh, like all those scenes in Cliffhanger and Iger Sanction where guys are like climbing up the mountains and mountaineering right. is a piece of of, uh, an, of the adventure. I get what you're saying. Yeah. And I haven't really seen much mountaineering as such in video games. And this might, something like VR might open up. I mean, imagine a, a video game, which is you climbing to the top of Everest. Yeah. That, that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm all about it. I And literally you're like, you have to cross the Kumbu Icefall and then you have to make it up to Camp 2 and then you yeah. have to make it up to Camp 3 and eventually you've got to traverse the Hillary Step. And, and you can like, be uh, kind of choking yourself out to simulate <laughs> oh my the, God. The, the, the thin oxygen up there. I swear to God, and, Brent, if autoerotic asphyxiation ends up in the title of this show, <laughs> I'm divorcing you. I'm telling you right now. You know, but, but you're right, though. I, and it, it just there's there's a lot of experiences that that I think about that I, I think would really, really be interesting in VR. I, I would love to see something where like a VR experience is just all about diving like these hyper realistic um, uh, shipwrecks. You know, obviously, right. you know, the, the most, the most famous of which would be the Titanic, I'm sure. Right. But just I'd like to have that experience uh, in, in relative safety, uh, you know, depending on your own sexual proclivities, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But having that uh, that ability to uh, you know to, to, to you know dive all these famous shipwrecks and and things like that that's something that that I've kind of had in the back of my mind that oh that'd be that'd be really really interesting to do you know and it's I mean like you know like I can I can go scuba diving if I want to but you know I can't I can't go scuba dive the Titanic or you know I can't afford to you know go down to uh, go down to the Bahamas and you know dive some of these uh, these these shipwrecks. Uh, you you know, like down in the Bermuda Triangle and you know stuff like that, right? And the VR, I, I'm I think, and and who knows? But you know, and there are games kind of along these. I've seen a, a like a Titanic games and shipwreck yeah. diving a little bit, but they're they're super niche, obviously. And mm-hmm. I just find it. I think it will be a much more compelling experience in VR. Uh, in VR, and so it's really really exciting to see some things like this popping up. Uh, speaking of popping up, we've got twelve minutes of Mafia Three gameplay. From IGN first with uh, with devs from 2K Marin uh, who are working on the uh, or I, actually is it's, is it 2K Marin or is it just people that uh, there's like a lot of people from 2K Marin I can't remember so they have the developers listed as Hangar 13 yeah uh, and 2K Check right uh, okay yeah Hangar so but I think I think Hangar 13 is made up of guys from 2K Check and yeah. some from 2K Marin they make some statement in the video that like Hangar 13 is a bunch of people from 2K Marin and and there are some people from 2K Check as well. Uh, but anyway, now that we've train wrecked the show for the sake of accuracy, <laughs> uh, Mafia. <laughs> but why be accurate, really? <laughs> Mafia Three. It, I mean, it wouldn't help us. Uh, we got twelve minutes of Mafia Three gameplay, and I think a really good mix of Mafia Three gameplay. We see, we get a, a flavor of the open world, and and that it is kind of a living, breathing space. That they, they they talk a little bit about. They don't necessarily show, but they talk a little bit about how there are things to do in this world. It, it, which is one of the complaints about Mafia Two is that yeah, this big open world, but there eh, there really wasn't anything to do other than to just play the main game. And they've said that uh, that was one of the pillars that they wanted to establish moving forward is that the open world does have things to do, things to explore, reasons to explore. But we see some gameplay. We see a lot of shootout stuff. We see uh, so some of the some of the, like, the larger scope gameplay of you taking over a hideout, which is apparently going to be a very big part of uh, of you building your criminal empire in this game. They talk uh, a lot about game mechanics, uh, weaponry, what they had in mind as far as the uh, the art design and the combat system and stuff. It's very very uh, information packed. So this 12 minutes is going to give you, uh, I think, a really, really good taste of Mafia 3. And if, in case you're wondering, Mafia 3 tastes really fucking good. <laughs> uh, yes, Brent, I agree. I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I was a little bit dubious based on the gameplay I had seen earlier. Yeah. Um, the snippets of it, it, it particularly, uh, one of the things they show is, is the, as you said, the hideout. And the way they showed the hideout... Uh, at I guess was it E3 when we first saw it? I'm not I'm not sure. Or shortly thereafter, yeah. I can't remember if, or I can't remember what it was or if it was uh, Gamescom in Cologne. But um, the way they showed the same hideout that they show in this video uh, was concerning to me. But actually, after watching this 12 minutes of video, um, it looks fantastic. And I agree with you uh, when you say that. Uh, what did you say? Veto tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> um, I, uh, I I agree with you. I I think this gameplay is fantastic. I I, I absolutely loved Mafia too. 
uh, and I'm really excited to see more about Mafia 3. I, th- I think this video is fantastic. I agree. Uh, they're aiming for a release in 2016, they say. Uh, yeah, which is super general. Could you be more general? Yeah, we'll, we'll see if they actually hit that. Yeah. Uh, but based on what we see in this, uh, in this gameplay walkthrough, I think that there's some exciting stuff to look forward to there. Uh, speaking of some things to look forward to. Yeah, you want 12 minutes? I got 17 minutes. I got 17 minutes, minutes of Firewatch. And That's right. I'm just going to. This, this is obviously the reference that we were making of the intro to the show. Uh, this is an interesting walkthrough in that it picks up immediately where the original 17 minute walkthrough of Firewatch left off uh, with Henry waking up the next day, having had his, uh, his Ranger Tower uh, raided, pillaged, burgled, and his blankets and some other, uh, some other equipment gone. And we just pick up from there and uh, and continue playing, and it's it, it's it's number one. It's a cool effect, and I'll say the same thing I always say about Firewatch because it's always true. Everything I see about Firewatch makes me want to play this game more. I'm really really interested in uh, in checking out Firewatch. It's a very different kind of game, but there there is something about it. There there is something about the tone, the intrigue, the the mystery of it. Uh, even even though a lot of it is very uh, pedestrian, you know, kinds of drama. Like, uh, there's a great moment in here where, uh, where the character you play, Henry, uh, he's talking with, uh, with the lady on the other end, his, his superior at the forestry service, and she's having a conversation with someone else, but he can hear it because she's left her radio in transmit mode. And you're like listening, like trying to figure out what she's saying. Is she talking about you? What is she talking about? Even just those kinds of things, which seem very, very mundane. I don't know. There, there's there, there's a flavor that really really gets me interested, intrigued. As I, as I said before, it gets me intrigued to to play this game and to find out what's going on. Uh, Lauren, what are your thoughts? I agree with everything you just said. I, I you know for me one of the things that is, stands stands out about this game is the dialogue. Yeah. Uh, I really I really enjoy what I've heard of the dialogue, the, the back and forth banter between uh, what appears to be the two main characters of the game. Um, I, I didn't realize that this this game is also scheduled for release on February 9th. Uh, I knew I knew it was early this year, but I, I don't think I realized it was February 9th. Yeah, so just again four I, weeks I was, away. I was thinking it was March for some reason. Say unless it's been changed, but currently it says uh, February 9th, and it's uh, I'll take w- it. which is means it's out on the same day as Unravel. And I, I feel I'll take like it. I I feel like I'm at the point with Firewatch where where I'm on a, a prepared to be on a just a media blackout because I feel like. I'm sold on this game. Yeah. Uh, I, I, unless I hear something just terrible about the game in the review, I mean, like just awful. I, I'm very sold on this game. I'm intrigued by it. Uh, I, the dialogue looks interesting. The style of the game looks interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I feel like this game is so story heavy, and, and so much of what I enjoy is is the dialogue and how the, how different the dialogue is. And the more I listen to, the less surprising it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like I, I, I'm just about that point where I'm. I'm done looking at stuff on this, and I'm just I'm just super excited. I, I am too. I I I am. I, Firewatch is probably the, the first game coming out this year that I, I'm really prepared to uh, to lose my mind for. So I, I'm very anxious to play that soon. Speaking of something else happening very soon, Lauren, when do pre-orders start for the Oculus Rift? Oh, but Brent, <laughs> just before you and I were about to get on to record this show, uh, I broke. found out. Thanks to the Ocu- uh, thanks to the Oculus, thanks to the Outlaw Gamers, uh, that Elizurger uh, on Steam. Um, let me know that the Oculus Rift pre-orders have been announced to begin on January sixth, my friend. So the so day if, that's tomorrow. If you're listening to this, the day the show comes out, it's tomorrow. That is correct. Wednesday, January sixth. They have not announced any details or pricing. Uh, they intend to do that when they open up the pre-orders. Uh, there was a there's a as you can imagine, a, a giant scream on uh, Reddit about, what do you mean you're telling us when the pre-orders are but not the price? To which Palmer Lucky responded, well, and I'm paraphrasing here, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> All major electronics release their pricing and details at the same time they open up pre-orders. It's what Xbox One did. It's what PS4 did. Um, so on, Octo- on, uh, on October, on January 6th, which happens to coincide with CES this year. Mm. Um, go figure. We will be getting, I would assume, uh, not only the price of the game, but also uh, all of the technical specifications, because obviously they wouldn't be expecting people to pre-order without any of that information. So Wednesday, 
is going to be there's going to be an Oculus dump. I would imagine we will be having a VR discussion come next week post CES. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll definitely keep you covered on that. Uh, and by keep you covered, I mean we'll attempt to prevent Lauren from hijacking next week's show and talking about nothing but the Oculus Rift. I'll do my best. I swear. That's that's not going to happen. But also, Brent, just so you know, I will be keeping my out, uh, eye out at CES, uh, specifically around virtual reality, to see if there's anything that will allow you to choke yourself out while watching VR. Well, th- I appreciate that, but I mean, I got I've got bungee cords and I got a hook in the ceiling here, and so. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, man. I really appreciate you thinking of me. <laughs> everybody we're back in the clubhouse and we've got a rather important topic to discuss with you this week but before we do that we are of course going to uh talk about the poll results from last week and for that i go to lauren baumgarten lauren yeah brent so last week of course or the last show was uh, our game of the year for 2015 you put up a poll asking if uh any of brent or my games were your 2015 games of the year and before we get to the results I should say that there were several people who wrote in and were disappointed that we did not include Bloodborne as at least one of the options, even though you and I did not uh, play didn't have it on our list. I think there were a lot of people yes, who did. Th- so that, that was the. I mean, if there was one game that really, really needed to get mentioned, uh, it, it was Bloodborne. Everybody let us know that that was also a very, very uh, popular title for them this year. And I certainly think, Brent, it would, it would come in at, at the least in third place. Um, maybe in second place, even depending if we had put it on there. But uh, so let me run down what we did put on. So I wanted to acknowledge Bloodborne, but let me run down the choices we did put on there. Coming in uh, for a tie of fifth place, Assassin's Creed Syndicate and Mad Max both had one percent of the vote. Until Dawn had two percent of the vote in fourth place. Rocket League with five percent of the vote in third place. So those four games really got a few votes each uh, for Game of the Year, but the absolute standouts. Um, at least on our list, Brent, were Metal Gear Solid Five coming in with 23% of yes, the vote, and The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt with an overwhelming, overwhelming 67% of the vote. The Outlaw Gamer audience chooses The Witcher 3, and I don't think Bloodborne could, uh, could do anything about that. No, I don't think so, but I do think, uh, my guess is if you asked a, a lot of people, they might have a, a game that was very close second, whether yeah. it was Metal Gear Solid for them or The Witcher 3 for the Metal Gear people or even Rocket League uh, for some people. I think there were a lot of uh, a, a lot of really good games or at least a good handful of really good games this year. I think you're right. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, checking out last our uh, last episode of the show for uh, commenting and for sharing your Games of the Year selections, Bloodborne and others included. Um, all right, so I told you it was an important topic, and it is. And there's no easy way to say this. And I know it's probably going to seem flippant like I'm joking, but I'm not. But uh, we are here today to talk about the end of Outlaw Gamer Radio as a podcast. Well, maybe there's a slight, cl- maybe there's a slight qualification to that. But uh, we are t- what we are talking specifically about is uh, we're, gonna, we're going to stop doing Outlaw Gamer Radio as a weekly podcast. We're leaving the door open because we are wishy-washy uh, <laughs> and want to have everything both ways. So we're not saying that, uh, that this is goodbye and you'll never see us again. But what we are saying is that after episode 50 of Outlaw Gamer Radio, we are not going to be doing the show uh, week in and week out as we have been. Lauren and I have uh, have talked about it, and and I'm going to let Lauren uh, really, really Lauren uh, decision uh, Lauren made is kind of precipitated this to a degree. But Lauren and I have discussed uh, what we want to do, and you know we like doing the show, and it's something that we want to leave the door open to do uh, if we want to in the future. You know, a theoretical situation might be, yeah, we want to do some E3 coverage, so. You know we're gonna we're gonna do do some shows around that, or uh, you know Gamescom or uh, or something like that, or you know maybe we just uh, we play Uncharted Four and say, oh man, you know we got to talk about this. But Outlaw Gamer Radio, as it has been, your your weekly source for gaming news and discussion, uh, that is, is what's going to be coming to an end in a few weeks after episode fifty, and 
I'll let Lauren talk a little bit about uh, his thoughts on this and and also uh, what what led him to uh, to call me up uh, several weeks ago and to say, hey, uh, I think I think maybe it's time to uh, to stop. Lauren. Well, I mean, to be candid, Brent, I, I think the listeners, you know, you talk about what led me to call you, and honestly, five years of a show with Brent, and I think you guys know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not at all. Not to be good. So uh, we'll talk. I want to. We'll talk in a minute about sort of what precipitated this and that sort of thing. I do. I want to uh, expand upon, uh, clarify, or expand upon what Brent was saying about sort of the nature of the show. Um, uh, episode fifty. So you don't have to go look it up. This is episode forty-seven. So it's the end of January. Is going to be our last sort of official episode. Um, and then you know what I think. Just to just to sort of reiterate and, and uh, maybe add, clarify, or add confusion to what Brent was saying. After that, Brent and I may or may not do shows moving forward. The website's not going away, first of all, and I, and I think we need to be very clear about that. Uh, the The website has financial support. We have enough resources to keep the website up and running for at least the next year. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as uh, you guys continue to want the website to be open, as long as there's money in the coffer. Uh, we will continue to run the website. Uh, I, I don't. I, I, I don't want to speak for you, Brent. Yep. But uh, every morning when I get up, every night before I go to bed, and usually once or twice in between, I'm on OutlawGamers.com. It is my primary source for gaming uh, news and information, uh, and and that's not going anywhere. Just so you guys know, the the conversation and the outlaws will still be here. Yeah. Um, and we'll still be on the site and all that. And stuff. we'll still be on the yeah. site. We'll still be running it. Our moderators, as long as they want to stay with us, will be here. Uh, nothing is going to change about the website. It is simply the podcast as it exists right now on a weekly basis is going to cease to exist. Now, um, uh, it doesn't mean we have plans to try and think of another way to do the podcast. I don't want to be nebulous with you guys about or give you any false hope. But the fact is, as long as the website is around, um, you know, we've put a lot of our life and we've been doing this now for five years. We had over 180 episodes of the Axe Factor and now 50 episodes of of uh, uh of outlaw gamer radio to- over over five years now brent we've been doing this yep um the podcast this podcast we've been doing for over five years you and i uh, have wor- been working together in one capacity or another for almost seven or eight years at this point yep. um and so uh, we care deeply about this community and we're very proud of this community and i think and we enjoy being a part of this community because of how special it is and because of the tenor uh of the conversations here and so that's the best part um, of it it is absolutely the best part of it. And so because we will still have a website. Because it sure as hell ain't you, son. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. Uh, now you're lashing out. Now you're just <laughs> lashing right. out, Brent. Um, I'm like a wounded we, animal with a letter opener. Ah! <laughs> because we still have this website, um, you know, uh, if we, like Brent said, if we decide we want to do a show about Uncharted 4 because we want to do a post-mortem of it, we're going to do that. We'll do if it. we decide three months from now that we want to just do a random episode of Outlaw Gamers because we miss it and we want to talk about stuff, we will. we're going to do that. If we decide around E3 we want to do whatever we feel like doing at the time, maybe it'll be two or three shows each, you know, over the course of three days, maybe it'll be one 20-minute show. If we decide we want to do that, we're going to do that. And so, um, But truth be told, if we decide we don't want to do any of that, well, we'll we're going to do that too. And so... We don't know what this is going to look like. We're both going to miss doing this, um, but we also don't feel like we can sustain it on a week-to-week basis. Uh, therefore, um, uh, once the show is over, you know, we'll just kind of have to play it by ear. That being said, uh, Brent wanted me to talk a little bit about what precipitated this um, sort of now for me. Uh, Brent and I have you know, talked about this a little bit on and off over uh, you know, the last few weeks or whatever, but really what precipitated it for me is sort of the decision to try and focus my energy uh, on something else in my life to move forward. There was a time, I don't know if you guys listeners recall, but this all started for me when I founded uh, Furious Gamer Radio back in 2007. This is how I met Brent and Daniel and Tony. Uh, and the idea for me was to try and develop an internet radio network uh, dedicated entirely to gaming, a 24-hour radio network a la a serious uh, satellite radio station that was talk radio dedicated to gaming. I spent several years of my life working on that um, while doing other things in my life and was unable to make that fully uh, come to the fruition that I wanted. I did develop an Android and an, and an iPhone app. I did have an internet web player, but it didn't fully realize the potential that I think it still has 
to this day, honestly. In the course of that, uh, Brent and I began doing a podcast together. I began writing for Epic Battle Axe, and this is not meant to be my personal history, but my point is is that at some tell point... Us, tell us about when you bought that sweater. That's, what I, that's so the part I want to get to. <laughs> don't be a dick. <laughs> at some point... <laughs> this is why I can't do this anymore, Brent. <laughs> uh, at some point... Uh, um, this stopped being about trying to make a living doing this or developing something in the gaming world for me and became just about enjoying doing it. Uh, well, for the last uh, several years, I have there is another focus that has entered my life uh, that I'm interested in, prof- in potentially uh, pursuing professionally uh, in my career, and that's writing. And so um, I have become ri- I began writing more in earnest, and I really want to focus on doing writing uh, moving forward, short stories, maybe a, maybe a book, that kind of thing. And to do that, it really needs to be the focus of my energy. And I'm going to have to literally cut down on the amount of gaming that I'm able to do. Uh, and I'm and therefore, I don't think I'll be able to produce as a show to the level or quality that uh, both you, the community, deserve and that Brent deserves and that I deserve if I'm going to take the time to do this. Uh, so that's kind of the impetus for me that uh, has really been the immediate shift is that I really... Um, I'm going to be focusing my energies primarily, uh, my ex- my extracurricular energies, uh, outside of my the job for which I get paid, uh, on working on some writing and trying to make that happen. And so, yeah. um, that was sort of the impetus, Brent, uh, for this to happen. Uh, and now, and the impetus for me to not do the show is because uh, for all, for all the grief I I, I give him, uh, if Lauren's not if if, if Lauren's uh, you know stepping away to concentrate on those other things, then. There, there is, there is no show for me because this show, at its core, what this show has been about is me and Lauren being friends, hanging out, talking video games. It's something that w- when Lauren and I were working together before we started doing a podcast, you know, we'd exchange emails and, and those kinds of things. But it wasn't until we met in person in L.A. at E3 for the first time uh, that we that we instantly knew that we, we just had like this great affection for each other. And, and I, I've often said, I mean, like from the first time I opened the hotel room door when Lauren knocked on it and, and offered me a massage, but it was it turned out to be a different room. It was weird. But anyway, but for the different first, story, the first time. time I opened the hotel room door and Lauren and I both looked at each other, it just got this huge grin on our face. Uh, after having spoken for so long, but finally meeting in person, like I have always felt like I, I like I've been friends with Lauren my, my whole life. That's You're painting this sitcom image of opening the door and you and I, uh, uh kissing is all I can see. Yes. <laughs> like slowly holding each other. It's three's company for, uh, for a new generation. That's right. Uh, but anyway, and when we got back from E3, I just said, we got to do something like we just got to hang out. You know, because like it, it really bummed me out the thought that we were just going to go back to like the email thing, and we weren't going to hang out and talk video games like we'd done, you know, for three four days straight. And this show was literally just Lauren and I saying we need to do something together so that we can hang out every week and just and just pal around and talk video games. And uh, and we've done it in that regard. This show has been madly successful. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Because uh, we have done that. Uh, and and I'll be honest. I mean, you know, there's weeks that it's been a grind. I mean, you know, there's weeks that I've not looked forward to doing the show, or like you know, we've like looked at the topic list and just felt like ah, oh, there's like nothing I'm excited to talk about here. And yeah, I didn't really play anything except like maybe Star Wars Commander, and I'm gonna have to like you know come up with some way to sound like you know that's fresh and interesting. Um, but that wasn't successful. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing that uh, the thing that I never ever. Uh, got tired of was uh, was a chance to hang out with Lauren for a while and and also to hang out with you guys. Uh, we, we've we've often told you guys, and I, I hope that I hope you understand it's not just fan service. Uh, that uh, that you guys are the, the the most important thing about this show and about this website, the Outlaw Gamer community, and the Epic Battle Axe community before it uh, is is the greatest gaming community on the internet. I'll take the Pepsi Challenge with anybody on that. And so, um, there's just no reason if Lauren's not going to be, I mean, cause you know, Lauren gave me, it, Lauren gave me his blessing. He said, look, if you want to keep doing the show, find another co-host. He's like, that's totally fine. And I had to think about it because on the one hand, I don't want to stop doing the show exactly. Like I really like podcasting and I want to do a podcast. It's something I really enjoy, but at the same time, it's, you know, I just, I can't imagine doing this show with anybody but Lauren. So 
that's that's what's going to happen. And and as far as uh, as far as me myself, like I said, I love podcasting. I want to keep doing podcasting. I have some I have some nebulous ideas about what I might do next, and and I think that I I am going to end up doing another show at some point when I'm when I feel like I'm ready and I, I've got like a really kind of firm idea on, on exactly what I want to do and how I want to present it. Uh, I am I am going to do uh, another show at some point down the road. I, I can guarantee that just because I I want to do it so badly. But for right now, I'm going to concentrate. I think a lot more on my YouTube channel, which I, I've actually been concentrating quite a bit on the last month or so, and I've got several things that are kind of shaping up there and getting ready to happen. And so that's going to be kind of my primary focus, at least as far as gaming stuff goes, uh, over on, uh, over on my YouTube channel. And so those are the things that are going to occupy my time in the immediate future that, and, you know, hanging out with you fine folks, which is always a good time. Yep. Indeed. Um, well, there, there you have it in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the whys of it. I mean, again, we're uh, we're going to go through the end of January. We'll, we'll let you know what we're going to do for the final show. We haven't made a decision about that yet. Yeah. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, I, I may miss Brent so goddamn much that I call him every week and three days and end up doing a show every week and three days, but that probably won't happen. Because uh, <laughs> truth be told, he doesn't miss me that much. Uh, that's right. I, I actually forgot my, your name at the my beginning of tonight's podcast. My mother doesn't miss me that much. <laughs> but... Uh, um, yeah, so uh, the next couple of shows will just probably, you know, there'll be regular shows. I don't know what we're doing for the last show, but uh, figure it out. There you have it, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, please know that I, I I don't plan on going anywhere. The website's not going anywhere. Nope. We will still participate here. We are so, um, you know, ridiculously grateful for for what is uh, again. I think not not just the best gaming community, honestly, Brent, but but one of the best internet communities that's out there it is it, we are the most but what about canada uh, what about canada we are <laughs> uh speaking of which if you didn't pick up south park the stick of truth uh it's on sale on steam for 8 bucks you should get it uh you, you know i i really do think we we have just such a a brilliant group of people here who have such great respectful discussions that I, that i fail to see on on any subjects website and and we we i know, i don't want to sound like a broken record we say it all the time but as brent said it's not fan service it's it's real it's important it's meaningful i have met ogers in real life in brazil uh daniel came out to brazil i have i uh, have relationships with ogers i play games with ogers all the time you're all over my steam friends my my uh, playstation friends and, and and i absolutely love it and i have no intention of going anywhere i just sort of you know we're ref- i'm refocusing some attention so um, Brent, I don't know. I don't know what else we can say on the subject. It's hard. It's been a hard decision to make for sure. Um, yeah, it is. It, it's not something nice that's, and hard. Yeah. It's not something that's uh, that's easy. Again, we've been doing this for many, many years, and we care very, very deeply about it. Both of us do. But um, uh, there you have it. And I will. Um, for those that are interested, I you know, again, not going away as I have, as I have writings that I wish to share with the public in general. You guys will be the first to hear about it here. Um, and I know Brent, obviously you're going to keep sharing content that you're creating and, and, uh, and there you have it. I hope, I, I wish you the best. Of course, Brent, I'm not saying goodbye to you right now. And even after I was going to say, what are you saying? Episode 50, I'm not saying goodbye to you, but I, I do want to say it on the air and, uh, uh, there you have it. That's it. So we'll talk more about it over the coming weeks. We just wanted to kind of let you guys know. We also wanted to let you have a nice holiday without, uh, what would have been probably the biggest lump of coal we could possibly put in your stocking because nothing would be more upsetting in the holidays than to hear this news. I agree. It's like this. There's not actually a face on Mars. And <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and, and that uh, there's never going to be another Motorhead album. Like Those are the worst things that could have happened this holiday season. <laughs> Thank God only one of them came true. That's right. Um uh, so with that, Brent, I, I think we, you know, we'll just say that we love you guys and we got a couple more shows to go and uh, maybe we can uh, head on out to the road and talk about some games that we have been playing. Okay, everybody, we're going to hit the road and talk about some of the games that we've oh, been playing Oh, you had to week. say we're going to hit the road after we just announced that. Oh, that we're hitting the, the road. And, oh, my God. Port, too soon, Brent. Port, too soon. Poor choice of words. All right, Lauren. Uh, in a complete breach of etiquette, I'm going to you first, even though my games are actually first in the list. What have you been playing? I, sir, have been having some good times. Uh, so it's been a while since we last spoke, but a few games that I will just sort of hit at the top. Yeah. Uh, played a little bit more Just Cause 3. Right. Um, 
boy, what a what a simultaneously tremendously fun and ludicrously disappointing game. <laughs> <laughs> it continues to be just so much fun at 15 frames a second. Huh. Listen, if you don't like the game, just go buy it again. That's the solution. So I brought. I told you I brought my PlayStation Four down to uh, Long Island this uh, this holiday season. I was there I'm for curious, five or six why days. Why did you just buy another PlayStation Four in Long Island and just <laughs> leave it there? Um, uh, I took it down there. I played some Just Cause Three. I ended up getting a marathon, like five hour play session. Ah, cool. Uh, it's just just tons of fun. But again, like every time you're doing anything, it's thirty frames per second. So right. Uh, so there was Just Cause Three. Witcher- I bought The Witcher Three on PS4. Yeah. Um, I have to say I, I, I'm a I'm a little bit disappointed with um, the downgrade right now, I and mean, I knew it was going to be a downgrade. Sure. Um, but and, and it's not even it's not even graphically the downgrade. It's it's just a couple of things in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, FOV. There's no FOV slide. Things that yeah. you can sort of hack on the PC what, that you can't hack on the PS4. What about the uh, what about the frames per second? How how, how smooth is it running? Um, it's for me so far. It's running fairly smooth, but I'm still very much in the tutorial phase. Okay. I played maybe an hour of it, All right. um, but I find that the FOV is driving me nuts, and I find that the um, uh, you know when you turn on Witcher Vision and it like uh, blurs. I do. Uh, I turned that off very early on on the PC, and I forgot that I had done that. And so now that it's back, I find it super annoying. Um, but I am really enjoying uh, starting to play the game again, and I have to tell you, Brent. This is the dumbest thing, but when I first started playing The Witcher 3, there's a very early on, and I don't know if you remember, uh, when you go into your very, very, very first bar just before you get in the fist fight with those guys outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a game of Gwent available to you. Oh. And as you know, as I'm sure you learned over time, if you beat anybody when you play them in Gwent, you earn a card. Yes, yes, I do know um, that. And you can also buy Gwent cards from... Certain merchants. Uh, from merchants. Yeah. I did not buy the Gwent cards, cards from the initial bartender, because I didn't think I cared oh, at that point. I didn't point. either. And, and and several hours later, I was like, "God damn it! I never bought those first Gwent cards." And so, uh, and I went back there, and she didn't have them for sale anymore. Restart. Uh, well, so I just started a new game on the PS4. Damn right. And and I I bought all the I'd cards gone, immediately. I think what I would have done, I'd have gone out. I got. I'd have bought a new copy and started a new game on that new copy. <laughs> That's what I would have done. <laughs> um. So uh, uh, I'm glad to have it on the PS4. I'm super excited to play it. Uh, I'm happy to start it again. It's not bothering me no, even no, slightly. Not kidding. To start it again. So oh, oh uh, darn! I I play Witcher three again. No, that's right. Uh, so yeah, so uh, that was one of my other games I've been playing over the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. What about you? Um, well, like I, like I mentioned, I got a hold of Disney Infinity and and Lego Dimensions kind of followed afterwards. Uh, I'd been playing Disney Infinity for a couple of days, and just getting my feet wet with that. And my wife asked me, how does this compare with Lego Dimensions? And I said, I, I don't really know, actually. So I got on YouTube, and I just, I, I can't remember what I searched for, you know, like Lego Dimensions versus Disney Infinity or something like that. And I found a lot of videos of, of people comparing the two, and they all sucked enormously, uh, at least insofar as what I wanted to know, like the, the comparative qualities that I really wanted to know about. None of them touched on I just made some offhand comments. It's like, you know, this is bullshit. It's like, I, I could do a better review than this. And she says, well, you ought to go get Lego Dimensions and, and do a review. And I said, okay, yeah. And so, uh, and then the next day she says, so are you going to go get Lego Dimensions today? And I said, yeah, sure, honey. I'm like, I'll just, I'll go buy Lego Dimensions today, you know, because, you know, we just, you know, we just had Christmas and, you know, that's, that's the thing to do is, you know, go out and buy yourself a new video game. <laughs> That's right. And uh that's what Christmas is for. So we're sitting there and we're just talking or whatever she says, "Oh, hey, I found a uh, I found a coupon for you, Lego Dimensions. You can, you can get Lego Dimensions for like uh 30% off today or something." Uh, I said, "You really want me to go buy Lego Dimensions?" She's like, "Yes. I want you to go buy Lego Dimensions and I want you to do the review on it and then tell me which of these that we should be playing." I'm like, "All right, no problem." And uh but anyway, the bottom line is basically she wanted to she wanted to have Lego Dimensions in the house. Because uh, she is a very big fan of the Lego games, as am I. So anyway, I went and got Lego Dimensions, and I've been playing both. I've been playing Disney Infinity, I've been playing Lego Dimensions, and uh, gathering material and stuff for this this head to head review I'm going to do of the two games. And uh, Disney Infinity is in 3.0 at this point. The starter pack I have it's the Star Wars uh, starter pack for Disney Infinity 3.0 that comes with um, uh, uh, Ahsoka from the Clone Wars and that that whiny bitch. Uh, Anakin Skywalker. I was trying to. I was trying to think of. Anyway, um, 
And I, I don't want, I, like, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to completely uh, spoil what I would say in this eventual review that uh, that I'm working on. But I will say this: I am continually surprised at actually how deep Disney Infinity is. I have to say that, and, and I'm sure you know it's it's expanded, you know, through these different versions, these different iterations. But my impression of what it would be to play Disney Infinity and what it actually is to play Disney Infinity. We're uh, we're kind of off, and I, I've been impressed thus far. It's it's a simple game, uh, you know. Like the, the game mechanics are are predictable and and somewhat by the numbers, but it is solid, you know. And the the amount of things that you kind of have to do within within the toy box, the, the game is kind of divided into the toy box, which is sort of a um, that's where you can get figures together from all you know all different properties and go and do things and 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 there's there's different types of gameplay there's exploration there's uh combat there's racing flying uh, you know you can depending on what you are in the mood to do you can just you know take you know Captain America and uh Han, and Han Solo and go and do some of that stuff with uh with a friend in co-op that sounds cool it is cool uh but you also have play sets which are basically they are video games that take place within Disney Infinity. They're like story-driven video games. Uh, the one that I have, Twilight of the Republic, is a uh, is a Clone Wars era game that takes place. Uh, be, you know, it starts on Geonosis from Attack of the Clones, where the Droid Factory is, and uh, and you know, mystery and intrigue leads you off as you're trying to track down General Grievous or or track down the threat behind General Grievous. You know, this is all stuff that happens between episodes two and three in the film continuity. And, you know, it stars Anakin and Ahsoka from the, from Clone Wars. And I mean, it's, it's just like kind of an adaptation of, you know, an episode or series of episodes from the Clone War TV show. It, like I said, it's not, it's not super deep gameplay. That part in and of itself is not super deep. It's, it's not incredibly rich and compelling. But it's very, very solid gameplay. You know, it can get a little bit repetitive, but it's fun in co-op, and and it's it's easy to kind of play for a little while and then put down. But the overall experience, like the fact that that is just one thing you can do inside of Disney Infinity, is, is pretty impressive. And there's a lot of building stuff you can create. You can create like a, a house for your toys, you know, and it can be like you, a secret base or a castle or you know, like a dollhouse or you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting things you can do as you earn sparks in the game through through doing gameplay and then you can go to the store and buy things to build a house for your your toys to hang out in and do things in and so when you're and forgive me because i i don't know these games very well yeah. the the disney infinity lego dimensions these are the games like skylanders right where you're buying yes, physical toys that's correct that you put on a little stand or whatever uh-huh. and they get in the game uh-huh. so when you talk about building a house for your toys are you talking about a physical no i'm talking about in the game world okay because you said you could go to the store and buy I'm sorry, yeah, I'm talking about an in-game store. Yeah, I'm talking about like you play, Oh, 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 oh you, okay. You're playing Disney Infinity, you defeat enemies, you accomplish tasks and you get these sparks, like like orbs. You just like collect these orbs that are kind of like currency. Right, and then you go to the in-game store and build something in the yeah, game. So, I gotcha. so like you can okay. go to the in-game store and you can buy things to customize your house. Either it's, you know, like maybe like a wallpaper pack from Tron or you can you can buy like as opposed to having like a door that swings open, you can buy like a big hatch from Star Wars, you know, things like that. Gotcha. So Disney Infinity continues to uh, to kind of impress me. I have not played Lego Dimensions as much. I have I've started on that. I've got maybe an hour into it thus far. It's uh, it's a lot like a Lego game, and it's got all of the the great kind of gameplay and humor and everything that that uh, that that infers. And that's what I've been playing. And so, can I ask you, like, what what are the what do these things cost? Like, what is Disney Infinity? Just just in a general, lot. the base cut game. Your, cut your arm open right now and bleed onto your carpet, and that's almost enough to buy one of these things. And does it like it, it, is Disney Infinity like two point oh, three point oh, four point oh? Are these things uh, like com- compatible with each other? Are they different games? Are they? Somewhat. So it, it's. I mean, so like when Disney 4.0 comes out, are you going to be able to go buy Disney 4.0 like figures and play them with what you have, or do you have to? So this is actually pretty complex, and I'm gonna 
I'm going to give you the caveat that I may not have this right before I explain it. But after okay. trying to answer this question for Tony the other night on the phone and spending some time on the Amazon.com webpage for Disney Infinity, here is the answer I have for you. Every so often, Disney will update the, the, the software, you know, from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, and they'll eventually it'll be to 4.0. Um, my understanding is that any characters that any characters that you have are going to work moving forward. I don't know if, if play sets, which is, is like the term that they use for basically like video games, like this Twilight of the Republic game I was talking about. I don't know that those continue to work as it moves forward. I'm not clear on that. As far as investing in new hardware, no. The, the hardware that you have now uh, should continue to work unless they introduce unless they introduce something new. But from what I understand, uh, there, there's been no major changes in the hardware, which is to say just like that base plate that you know you put the figures on to unlock them in the game. They haven't made any major changes to that that I'm aware of. So in theory, you're not going to need to invest in new hardware. However, if you go on the PlayStation Store and look to upgrade from like Disney Infinity 1.0 to 2.0, it's $15 to buy Disney Infinity 2.0, the game. To buy Disney Infinity 3.0, the game, it's $20. So having the hardware, uh, having the hardware is fine. You, you can just hang on to that. But if you do want to get the next version of the game, rather than go out and buy a new starter pack, you have to buy uh, basically the upgrade, as it were, in the PlayStation Store. And that does cost a little bit of money. The the figures are about fourteen dollars US each, and for one figure. For one figure yeah, so I'm like, looking at this now. So like, on solo, fourteen dollars. Uh, the Luke play Skywalker. set, which the Force Awakens play set, which includes Kylo Ren and Rey, yep. is twenty five. Yeah, and and that would include. I would imagine that that would include Kylo Ren, Rey, and then it probably also includes a play set game. And then there's a bundle, a Force Awakens bundle, which includes uh, the play set of Kylo Ren and Rey. Yep. All, then a single Poe Dameron and Kylo Ren. Okay. And that's currently listed at $63 on Amazon. Right. So, yeah, it can get expensive fast. Like, they have they have those play sets like you're talking about that usually come with two figures. You can get a play set that's got Luke, Leia, and then uh, I think it's called Spark of Rebellion is, is the game that takes place. There's in Disney Infinity, Star Wars Rise Against the Empire playset. That's maybe, Luke maybe that's it. Yeah, Rise Against the Empire. And that is the, uh, yeah, Spark of Rebellion is, is uh, the Star Wars Rebels TV show. But, uh, but the point is that like that, that's the, the Star Wars video game for Disney Infinity that takes place like in the classic trilogy timeline. Wow. So is this and, a game that... And then there's another um, one for Star Wars Rebels. Like if you're a fan of the Star Wars Rebels TV show, which I am, I fucking love Star Wars Rebels, in fact. Uh, but there's Star Wars Rebels figures and there's a, there's a, a playset game that you can get that takes place, you know, with the Star Wars Rebels characters. So now, is this a game that someone like, say, me, mm -hmm. who likes things like Star Wars and blah, 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 and is an adult but doesn't have kids, like, is this a game someone like me would play, or is this a game that you, you're going to buy, like, generally if you have kids? You know, it's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, generally if you have kids. It's, but it's an interesting question. I, I, had this, I had this conversation with uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Ben. He, uh, his, his girlfriend, she's got uh, three kids. And uh, she's got twin boys who are seven years old, and they got the exact same Disney Infinity starter pack for Christmas that I did. And she says that her kids are loving it, and they're really into Star Wars Rebels, and you know, so like they want to get the Star Wars Rebels figures and play set and everything, you know, to play in the game. And I have to say that, like, I want to I want to play it a little bit more before I I, I declare this in in any sort of uh, in any sort of definite way, but. I have to say that right now, I think that it's it's probably geared more towards a younger audience, but if you have enough of an interest in a specific property like Star Wars or Marvel or something like that, I think that there's enough here for you to get into that, uh, that you could enjoy yourself. But I haven't spent enough time with it yet to, to tell you whether or not I feel like it, the gameplay is going to get really old and repetitive after, you know more than four hours or something like that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave myself a little bit of a window to, to maybe walk that back if I feel that way. But right now I have to say that I think that there's enough going on in Disney infinity between the actual gameplay you can do between like the customization and stuff like that, that's going on the quote unquote base building you can do within the, within the interior. Um, 
I think that there's enough there that yeah, I I, th- I think it's something that that people from a lot of different age ranges could get into. Well, that's really interesting, man. And I got to tell you, when you get the review done, uh, I know this guy who uh, runs this this place called Go Kid Gamer. Yeah, might be interested in buying uh, uh, your review. Mm, I'm just putting it out there. For I you. hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. That's a good point. Just a thought for you. So, uh, all right, Brent. My last that game that got, I was that playing guy's got a really weird sense of humor, from what I know of him, though. Uh, he does too. Of, it's hard to talk to him with a straight play. face with the hair. Yeah. Um, uh, one more game I played, Brent. I mentioned to you. I bought uh, Battlefield Four and all of its contents, and I have to say that I am extremely pleased with my purchase. Um, uh, I was surprised to find out when I went back to the game that I actually had put in around 120 hours previously, and while many of them were super frustrating. Um, I, I have no issue giving uh, EA or uh, and Dice twenty bucks for all of that content plus all of everything I have now. Um, uh, Dice LA has been working very hard on fixing uh, a year and a half later all of the the fuck ups from the original release of the game, and the game is playing extremely extremely well. There are tons of servers, and I'm having. A fantastic time uh, playing it with my buddies Aaron and Jeremy and Danny. Uh, so um, uh, there's just tons of maps. There's all these maps that I haven't played before, all these weapons that I haven't played with, um, all these gadgets that I haven't played around with. And so uh, really enjoying BF4 and looking forward. It's been a while since I've had a really good online multiplayer game uh, to play with my friends that my friends are playing and uh that's, I, I'm that's lo- the real trick right there I, i'm it is and uh I, i'm really enjoying the game nights although they haven't been many yet but they have been a lot of fun uh the ones that we've had so really enjoying uh battlefield 4 again uber well let's go ahead and ride into the sunset lauren yes for uh for episode number 47 here and i'm going to start off with uh s- some sad news I-, I told you that only one of the most tragic events that can happen over the holidays happened over the holidays and that is the fact that there won't be any more motorhead albums on account of the fact that the legendary frontman of motorhead lemmy killmeister is dead at age 70 uh he was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer two days before he ended up uh dying and it was uh it's i don't know like it it simultaneously sucks like i have really weird feelings about it it simultaneously sucks and yet at the same time, if there is any example of a human being who really, really lived it up to the fullest all the time, it, it's fucking Lemmy. Uh, this is a man whose doctor told, because of his lifelong drug habit, uh, this is a man whose doctor told him that if he were ever to in- receive a infusion of quote unquote clean blood, it would kill him. And if his blood were ever to be pumped into another human being, it would kill them. This is one of the five reasons that the airheads are correct in saying that Lemmy is God. Uh, this man and his band Motorhead are responsible for inspiring the, the movement that became heavy metal. He is one of the most legendary figures in rock and roll. And his shadow, his shadow is so long that, uh, that I, I don't know that we'll ever, ever see the end of it. This is a guy who who did who did it all like everything that you think sex drugs and rock and roll is about lemmy is at the center of of, of one of those stories he's been doing it since uh, since the 1960s and uh and i i just i i can't say enough i mean if you know who lemmy is you don't need me to talk this up but if you don't know who lemmy is i'm trying to put into words how legendary a guy this is um almost any heavy band that you've heard of you ask them about their influences and motorhead's going to be in there at some point uh daniel kaiser uh, and i used to i used to always tease him mercilessly about rush and and uh and and he he loves rush and and i'd always give him grief for it and he'd say namely a better power trio and i'd say motorhead and it stop him dead in his tracks uh cuz he knew he had nowhere to go from that one so anyway let me kill meister uh, died on uh, on December twenty eighth uh, at his home, and his uh, his memorial service is going to take place at his favorite uh, haunt, which is uh, the Rainbow Bar and Grill in L A. And if I were there, I'd be going down there to have some drinks uh, with some some fellow people who who want to spend the day just playing Lemmy's music really fucking loud and remembering what a truly awesome and surprisingly wise and intelligent guy Lemmy Kilmeister was. Not just a metal warlord, 
but uh, a really, really amazing human being. So this one is to Lemmy. All right. I'm sorry to hear, Brent, that you uh, lost somebody near and dear to you. I, I do not know Motorhead, but obviously he was very important. So uh, I'm sorry to hear that on a slightly, um, on a, well, on, on a slight, I was going to say slightly less reverential note, but perhaps as reverential. Um, I have, I'm actually taking from one of our listeners what they put up um, in, in, for one of their end of the sunsets. Um, and I did this actually before we knew about the announcement of Oculus coming uh, for pre-order on the 6th, but Erroneous posted something that I wanted to talk about, and so I decided to use it as my end of the sunset. And that is uh, about PlayStation VR getting an extra box to help with creating 120 hertz VR games. And there's a link here to your game article. PlayStation VR has for a long time looked like the VR solution um, to be much more approachable by the average user, but there has been con- concerns about the PS4's hardware to run VR games. Could this extra box move PlayStation VR to a level of the PC VR? And what about price? So you have to wonder what the price will be when it, they have to have an extra box like this included. And so uh, I just I just kind of wanted to uh, call this out again. I think we're gonna, we're obviously now going to get a lot of announcements about VR over CES the next week. True enough. I'm sure we'll be talking about it uh, during our next show. Uh, certainly PlayStation has alluded to the fact that VR will essentially be the price of another console. Um, and so it will be hooked up to the PlayStation 4 so far as we know, but it will have its own separate box. And I, and I have to assume that that is partially, if not completely, uh, to offload um, uh, the the VR nature of the games from the processor and graphics card that are in already installed in the PS4, yeah. which uh, at least as, as you compare them to the Oculus Rift, uh, wouldn't be capable of running games uh, at um, uh, at 60 frames or 90 frames per second um, at the right refresh rates and all that. And so um, certainly this is a big part of that. So we look forward. I look forward to hearing a lot more over the next week, and hopefully we'll have more information about that. Um, in the ride along, Brent, uh, the, uh, the comment that we chose to use for our ride along this week comes to us from Aronica Spell. Aronica Spell, I hope I'm saying that right. Aronica Spell says, I gotta say, it's getting pretty annoying hearing about people within our medium asking for, quote, objective reviews. As a reviewer myself, I often have this <clears> conversation <throat> with other reviewers, and some of them actually try to write what they view as a, quote, objective review. This is so wrong in a lot of different ways. Let me tell you about just a couple of them. Number one, a review is not something written or composed by a robot. It is experienced from the minds of a human being. Each individual has their own experiences and should never try to reach a point where objectivity is the goal. In that case, we would just write, it's a video game, and that's it. Even if we're, experienced, uh, even if we're expecting a reviewer to be professional in his or her work, um, The professionalism doesn't lie in the objectivity, it lies in the vocabulary of that writer, the way he or she expresses his or her feelings regarding the experience he or she just went through. Number two, if we we ever would come to accept that objective reviews is a goal for our medium, then we should also accept it is, we should also accept it as nothing else but a simple toy, something you use up before you go on to the next big thing. For my part, as a reviewer, I would never accept that since I believe that we can treat games with more dignity and the people shouting for objective opinions and ethics in game journalism, who actually is, are the ones holding our very beloved art form back from growing. Where I believe that a lot of consumers have gotten it all wrong is within the news coverage around the industry. Too many feel that editors are acting like promoters for the very companies that they are covering. Well, guess what? We, are, we as consumers are eating out of their hands. We, are following, we as followers are clicking those links. Pre-ordering those games, season passes, and so forth. This is where the discussion regarding objectivity should be focused, not around the reviews. Get it right. Peace. <laughs> That's what Aranaka Spell has to say. It seems to me there's kind of two different ideas going on there. Like uh, the 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 idea of like objectivity, and and of course, I mean, like you know, from a philosophical uh, from a philosophical standpoint, you know, the notion of objectivity and whether it, it can be achieved is you know kind of fraught with with Camelot levels of well, peril. Certainly. Yes, right. Just like altruism. Yeah, but uh, the, but the the idea of the sort of objectivity debate, and then like the ethics in game journalism, like to me, those seem like two distinct things. Um, and and yeah, you know, and, and I don't know. Like I didn't read I didn't read his uh, his original post. You know, perhaps he followed up with uh, with with some clarification to that. But insofar as as the objectivity thing goes, I, I agree. I mean, I think that you know the the whole reason that you. Re- read a review is to you know get somebody's somebody's take on here's how i felt playing this game i i had fun i didn't have fun i felt moved i didn't feel moved 
uh, you know, obviously you, you need to have some, you need to have some qualitative discussion on, on that person's view on the game. But the, the ethics in game journalism thing, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that I, I, I don't know if I agree with him as strongly extending to that, uh, assuming that he's sort of defining the ethics in game journalism as I am. Um, I, I think that, uh, I think there, there is a case to be made, uh, for the latter. Uh, I agree with everything you said, Brent, but I really appreciate having the opinion of somebody who's a reviewer. Uh, no idea uh, if this person is a professional reviewer, if they're getting paid to do this or not, right. but, uh, it's always nice to have the opinion and we absolutely greatly appreciate the comment. Aranaka spell. Um, and with that, Brent, we have reached the end of yet another show. Yes, indeed. As usual, we invite your comments on everything we talked about in our show today, whether it was what we talked about in the ride along just now with objective reviews, whether it was what we talked about in the sunset PR and on the unfortunate death of Lemmy Kilmeister from Motorhead up in the road. We talked about Disney infinity Lego dimensions, just cause three, the Witcher three on PS4 in particular and battlefield four and up in the top in the garage. We talked about a lot of stuff. Oculus Rift pre-orders going live January 6th, uh, 17 gorgeous new minutes of firewatch mafia three, the climb, Kojima's new partnership with Sony and at the release date of Unravel. Of course, I didn't mean to skip over our clubhouse discussion, which is the end of this show. We invite your comments about that topic as well and anything else that you would like to comment on related to the gaming industry. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>